treasure you, Lord. Treasure you with all of our heart. Praise the Lord. Well, that reminds me of a verse we're going to look at first this morning. <laughs> so, turn to Proverbs 3. Put a marker in Romans 12. And we might be over in First and Second Timothy. This assimilation thing is getting completely out of hand. <laughs> As I can continue to assimilate, <clears throat> spend time praying in the Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, it's, uh, even the Old Testament, I was really reading Romans 12 this morning, which is, you know, we dwell on 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2 a lot. Nearly everybody could quote it by heart, just a moment. which will be there in a minute. But today I was reading the rest of it, the uh, Romans 12, the whole chapter in Romans 13. And as I was reading it, I was going, you know, this sounds so familiar. And it's this passage here in Proverbs. And it's so interesting, this, you know, God, is, God doesn't change. <laughs> but how he had to deal with spiritually dead people in the Old Testament and how he has to deal, or let's say gets to deal, with spiritually alive people in the New Testament is different. But he doesn't change. He's still, he's always been trying to get man to walk uprightly and, and like the true sons that he's originally made man. So <clears throat> let's just read a portion here. Now the verse that probably everybody could quote is verse 5, Proverbs 3, 5. And let's do it first. Said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And, and most people take those two out of, you know, just out of context and apply it. And really, in that particular case, that's not too bad. But it really makes more sense to you if you leave it in the setting of what he's talking about. Now, he's dealing with spiritually dead people. What, is it, what does it mean to a spiritually dead man? How do, how do you do that? How do you trust in the Lord with all of your heart? Because Paul, writing in Romans 7, gives you a glimpse into the unregenerate man's heart. He says, I wouldn't even have known it was wrong to covet. You know, except I had read it in your law. You know, your law said not to covet. And I went, what? <laughs> so how, how does a spiritually dead man trust in the Lord with all of his heart? How does he know what the Lord... See, and again, I'll remind you... He, we get one of the frequent prayer requests that we get at Gary Carpenter Ministries anyway that comes over the internet. Would you, would you pray with me that my lawsuit against my brother would be successful? And, you know, <laughs> where do you start with, with that request? See? Well, go back here to, uh, what, so what does he mean? In the context, to a, like to a spiritually dead man, what does it mean? Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart, and he shall direct thy paths. Well, let's just back up. Like Pastor Dave says, you don't have to go very far. Just start in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now, to a spiritually dead man, God's trying to deal with them as sons. But for them, he had to give them a law written in stone. He had to give them a written law externally for them to look at. It says, my son, forget not my what? Forget not my law. Well, the law says, don't covet. Okay, but their heart says, thou shalt covet. <laughs> the spiritually dead man says, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with sleeping around? You know, I mean, it seems right to me. <laughs> Every culture on earth practically was, uh, you know, uh, monogamy was not the standard <laughs> for most of human history. And uh, it says, some, my son, forget not my law. Let thine heart keep my commandments. To a spiritually dead man, he says, look, you don't know how to live. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. We're really right back to Genesis. We're back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, see? Man, spiritually dead man, looks at his own heart and he says, well, I want what Joan has. I shall go steal it. <laughs> and a spiritually dead man says, at the end of that, see, I wanted it. I have it. Everything's great. God says, that's not how you live. Well, how do I live? 
Well, keep my law. But God, your law says I can't have what Joan has. <laughs> I, I can't go get her stuff. He says, God says, I know. Well, he says, that doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> God says, well, you're going to have to trust me. Even though it goes against everything in your nature, <laughs> everything in you wants to covet, lie, steal. <laughs> There's interviewing this one guy on TV. You know, most people lie about lying. They say, you know, I don't lie when they do, you know. Well, this inter- I, I saw an interview this week, this interview, and this guy goes, oh, I lie all the time. It's better for me. I found out when I lie, I don't get in so much trouble. <laughs> Now, there you go. There's a, that is a perfect picture of an honest, spiritually dead man. <laughs> you know, I'd like to have that guy here at the church. We've got something to start with here. At least the guy's honest about lying. <laughs> well, anyway, let's go back to that. So God's trying to convince spiritually dead people to trust him. He says, now, my law is better for you. No, it's not, God. No, if I go steal, I have more stuff. But let's continue what he says here. Son, don't forget my law. Let thine heart keep my commandments. And now God's offering him the carrot. You know, he's going now for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. And even the spiritually dead man goes, well, I want to live a while. Uh, length of days, long life. Yeah, I'd like to have that peace. Yeah, I'd, I like peace. Well, God says, if you keep my law, you'll have that. And he says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Now, what he's talking about there is his law. Still, he hasn't changed the subject. Bind them. Bind them what? You know, they used to wear those phylacteries and the things that he's talking about. Keep remembrances of my law. They would even nail them on the, over the doorposts and on the, on the posts of the doors, you know. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Now, what he meant by that, they couldn't write, they couldn't make a new nature for themselves. But he's saying, memorize these things. Did you know the kings, the first, the kings in the Old Testament, uh, they had to, if I remember, it was the first five books. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Somebody could correct me. But it's several. They had to write, hand write their own copy of the law. Handwrite it. Why? So they would be prone, or at least have the knowledge. At least, from that point on, they're held accountable <laughs> before God. They, they wrote their own copy. They know what it says. Anyway. Write them upon the table of thine heart. For the spiritually dead man, he has to keep referring to God's law. He can't really look to his natural tendency. See? So shalt thou find favor and good understanding... In the sight of man. And in that context, he says, now trust in the Lord, spiritually dead man. How do I do that? I'm going to keep your law best I can. I'm going to try and keep it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Now, how would you do that? I really want to go steal Joan's stuff. I re- She's got some good stuff over there. I really want to go steal it. Might go steal Mark's stuff. He's got good stuff. You know? And so, but... The Lord says, thou shalt not covet. And the Lord says, thou shalt not steal. Well, what am I going to do? Lord, against every natural inclination in me, I am going to trust you, and I am going to keep your law. And by that process, Lord, I'm trusting you to direct my steps. I'm trusting in your law, so I'm not going to steal. That, my steps are a life of not stealing. Verse 7, be not wise in thine own eyes. Now, we're right back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil again, see? Be not wise in thine own eyes. Well, what in the context, what does that mean? I'm telling you, it's better if I go steal. <laughs> it's better if I lie. It's better if I this, better if I, revenge is a good thing, God. Don't you know about revenge, you know? <laughs> but be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. See, the natural man does not know what's evil. Stealing is evil, lying. All these things that God, here we go, we're right back to God has to tell you what's right and what's wrong. We're right back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And he says, if you'll be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be, mer- shall be health to thy navel. I want a healthy navel. <laughs> oh, and marrow to thy bones. That's real good. I like it. It's going to be health to the bones. Now go over to Romans 12. While we've got that all in our mind, I was reading this today, over in, uh, this morning, over in Romans chapter 12. And you've got to remember, in my mind, Romans 12 really picks up at the end of Romans 8. Because in, in 9, 10, and 11, it's like you could put a parenthesis almost around those three chapters. Paul digresses from the main teaching he was doing, and he, he spends some time talking about the salvation of the Jews. But then here in 12, he's right back to what, to what he was teaching about all the way up through Romans chapter 8. Well, what was in Romans 8? He, talk, he introduces not only the, the new birth, he introduces the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit has also come to help us in our walk with God and overcoming the flesh. So picking it up here in, in 12 verse 1, the, the verses we normally do is verses 1 and 2. But we're going to go on a little farther today. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, right here, we have done it the last two services I did. We're not going to do it again to get today, but read it for yourself. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a review. Until a person is born again, they really have no capacity to understand God's nature. You can't be taught the things of God. It plainly tells you the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. You know, these things have to be spiritually discerned. You have to have the nature that Dave has used, Chuck the duck. You have to have the nature of the duck to really understand duck things. Well, you have to have the nature of God to really understand God things. That's, that was good right there, see. And he sent a spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be the teacher of that new nature. So the communication, the transfer, is from spirit to spirit, really. And then eventually your mind begins to get in, in on it as you're spiritual man understands God through that process picking it again this is just picking right up at the end of chapter 8 he's talking about the Holy Spirit who makes those intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered we don't know what to pray as we ought meaning I don't even know what's wrong with me I don't know what I don't know why I keep doing the things I do but the Holy Spirit does and as we allow him to pray and make intercession for us with that bypasses the intellect, and he makes intercession for us according to the perfect will of God. And that's one of the ways through that process that y- your mind begins to be renewed like it talks about here in, in, ver- in uh, verse 2. So it's really the parallel from Proverbs 3. There they had to go look at God's written law. But in, the new, in, in our uh, dispensation, the law has already been written in your heart and as you yield time to the Holy Spirit, he literally brings that, that law, that nature, that understanding of God. through it, it grows and magnifies from the spirit man first, really up through the mind. And you find that your whole thinking process changes. And it's really more than thinking. Your whole heart motivations change. How you see people changes. How you understand the Father's heart changes. How, you're, how you value people compared with your stuff changes. And you become, a, you become more and more unlike the world. Remember last time we, talked, we went to John 17, and Jesus plainly says, Father, they, have not, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I keep telling you, you're aliens. <laughs> We're invaders from heaven. It's really, uh, it's that old movie, you know, uh, The Body Snatchers. It is. I mean, God snatched you. You know, everyone thinks you're the same old creature. Yeah, that's the same old Mark I knew before. They don't know that he's been snatched by God. That's the same old body, but there's a different person in there. Same old Gary, but there's, you know, you look at my body, say, that's the same old Gary. No, I'm not. I've been snatched. I've been <laughs> God killed that old guy, and he needed killing. I'm telling you right now. But there's residue of the way that guy thought still in my brain that's being overpowered removed, uh, overcome, 
repossessed by the spirit of the living God so that I think like he thinks. See, There you go. And that's that renewing process. And you get stranger and stranger. Aren't you happy about that? Your family already thinks you're strange. They're going to think you're more strange next time they see you. And that's okay. But see, they also know where to come when, you, when they need prayer. You know, they know where to come. Hmm. All right, so let, let's go on a little bit past here. And I, some of these verses in the King James are a little blind, so I brought the amplified version of Romans 12 today. So let's read verses 1 and 2 again, get this flow in our mind. Yes, sir. Can I, do you, I want to make sure you see the parallel between Proverbs 3 and Romans 12, what I've said so far. Here's the difference. If you were still that guy with the sin nature, you could not look to your heart. If you look to your heart, you're going to go steal. You're going to go covet. You're going to go lie because it, that's what seems to be in your best interest. That's being wise in your own eyes. That's doing the opposite of what God says. So under, under the old covenant, you'd have to go look to God's written law. You'd have to memorize it. Maybe you could get it in your heart after a while. That's what he was saying. You could memorize it, you know, but still it's going to go counter to your nature the whole time. Under the new covenant, your nature really has changed. I'll say it again like this. Uh, the spiritually dead man does not know it's wrong to steal. If you get born again, truly born again, and maybe you've been stealing paper clips from the office for 10 years, you know, you get born again at one of those Holy Ghost meetings, you know, Dave Roberson meetings, you, get, you know, born again. Don't even have to be spirit-filled, just born again. And the next Monday, at you, as, as you're finishing up your work day and it's time to go home and you remember you need paper clips at home. You've been taking them little 10-cent boxes of paper clips for years. You reach to steal one just like you have all this time. And you can, now you got born. There's going to be something on the inside of you go, don't do that. And you'd be going, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Well, that's a new nature on the inside of you, see. You know, nobody has to teach you it's wrong to steal. If you're really born again, you know it's wrong to steal. The law is now on the inside. So now, how do you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding? You've got to be guided from the inside now. Because you're going to come up, yes, sir, it's right in this chapter. We're going to come right to it. <laughs> You're going to be guided by his nature, which is love. And that is the fulfilling of the law. So let's go on now to verse 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, and that I'd like to use the word assignment right there. That's the assignment given to, part of his assignment given to him by, by God. For the grace given to me, I say to you, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I'd love to digress right there and go into the long, uh, the long version because it's so classic of how Dave teaches that, you know. You go to those that be somewhat among them. What does that really mean? And they'll say, well, Brother Dave, we don't know if that's really the measure of faith or a measure of faith. You know, like that makes all the difference, you know. So God one day showed him the piece of the pie, you know, and says, well, now, what do you want? You want a fourth of a piece of pie, or do you want a 64th piece of a pie? Well, man, I want the 64th piece, you know. He said he didn't understand as the numbers got bigger, his piece of pie got smaller. <laughs> but see, every piece is a measure of a whole. And that's really what it's talking about. It's going, God gives to every man. Whatever it is he's called you to do, if you're a teacher, if you're, he's about to list a bunch of gifts here. It doesn't matter what administrations, helps, governments, whatever it is. He gives you the measure of faith to fulfill your calling. You can't go to him at the, at, now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That doesn't mean you don't have to do your part, but it's sure been made available to you. All right. So God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, you're a measure. You're part of a whole, a whole what? The whole body of Christ. God's looking to each of us to fulfill our part. For as we have many members in one body, there it is, there's many slices in one pie. <laughs> and all members have not the same office. For we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. 
having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether, and now let's stop, he's going to start listing them. And again, you don't get to choose your grace. I think I will become, I will be an apostle. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do people that tell me they're an apostle have to work harder at, me, at it to get me to believe it? Now, if, they, if I just watch them, I might go, dog, gone. I think that's an apostle right there. But they, 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 they started in the basement if they start telling me from the get-go they're an apostle. <laughs> now they're going to have to prove it. <laughs> because humility is one of the main marks of an apostle. No, I can't go there. <laughs> you don't get to choose. See, I tried. I, 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 time out. In the, in the early, early days, Michael knows, in the early, early days, we had a, had a group, and we were, they got saved at his Bible study. He's sitting right here for benefit of those that can't see him. And we're all in this Bible study. Man, we are, one thing about it, we got radically saved. Now, we did. We'd, n nothing interested us but serving God. We wanted to, I mean, we were, Michael had to do everything he could to, you know, we were going to be those mountaintop people just went and prayed. <laughs> <laughs> didn't care about the, nothing, no business, no jobs. You know, it's, it's, isn't the rapture coming next week? We got to go, you know. So, Michael, he's trying to teach us, uh, you know, no, no, keep your job. <laughs> well, this little group, I mean, we're on fire. And we didn't understand any of those things in those days, you know. I didn't, even, I didn't know I was a teacher. I didn't know I was called to be a teacher. Nobody in that little group knew what they were yet. I look back on it now, and it's so obvious to me. This, that one was an evangelist. That one was a prophet. I was a teacher. But, man, we kept putting pressure on everybody to fulfill our calling. And this one guy was such an evangelist, he would put such a guilt trip on me. It, just like Alan says, you know, Alan, he, 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 he said it perfectly. He says, you know, we're, those, a pure evangelist, he'll say, what are you people doing over there dying to your flesh? We've got people going to hell right now down here on Peoria. You get in that car, go with me. We're going to go win souls tonight. You hear me? And they're so good at it, pretty soon you're going. <laughs> and I did. And this guy was a pure. He could, he could, by accident, win more people to Jesus than I could on purpose in 30 days of trying. You know, he just walked by and breathed. People want to get saved. It's just, you know, it's a calling. I'd do the same thing. You know, now I can share my testimony. I, I, it's not that I can't tell somebody how to be saved, but I couldn't. I thought something was wrong with me. I couldn't understand it. You know, I'd start trying to, you know, just automatically start trying to teach them stuff, not knowing that they have no capacity to learn it till they're born again. <laughs> and Paul is saying, look. It, and get, keep this in the context of Romans 8. He, he, he's, all of this fits if you'll keep it in the context of Romans 8. He says, if you'll do what I taught you in Romans 8, you'll find out what your calling is. See, in the flow of that, he's saying, now look, we have gifts differing. Don't be trying to make everybody into your cookie cutter mold, what you think you, you know, everybody ought to be. God, if we could go back to those days now, those same guys, their calling hasn't changed. I could tell you now, that one's an evangelist, that one's a prophet. Now I know I'm a teacher. So what, we, what, what would that little body of Christ, what should we have been doing? Well, the evangelist guy, he gets a group of like-minded people, and they go evangelize because he could care less about teaching them nothing. Once they're saved, he's done with them. <laughs> it's on to the next bunch. That's where his heart is, and that's what he should be doing. See? But what we should have been doing is working together. He'll go get them saved, bring them in, set them down, let me teach them, and let the prophet come too. I mean, they could benefit from the prophet, you know. And the evangelist do the work of the evangelist. Let the teacher do the work of the teacher. The prophet do the work of the prophet. We needed a Tim Stemple. We needed, we needed helps and governments and administrations. We need, we, but anyway, it was, it was fun. <laughs> it was good training. It was really good training. We, and none of us killed each other either. It was great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. God, he'll, you pray, you will event. Really what will happen if you pray what you are, you can't be anything else. It will just take you over. 
If you pray and allow the Holy Ghost to magnify whatever it is God has called you to be, you, you can't help it. You will, he will direct your steps. He will literally direct you into that calling. Hmm, that was good right there. Then he starts listing some of them. Whether prophecy will let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. And that's, that word wait there is like a server. Let's, you know, like a, like a waiter in a re restaurant. Okay, let us do that. He that teacheth. On teaching. Mm, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, I finally found my place here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'll let the evangelist evangelize, the prophets prophetize. And I will teach us, I will teach us eyes. I'll teach. You know? Or he that exhorteth on ex exhortation. Now he that giveth. Here's, that, here's, here's your gospel entrepreneur, or it could be a gospel steward. Could be a gospel entrepreneur steward combined here. There, but there's people that are called as a ministry to giving. And the church goes, what? <laughs> There's a ministry. Look, right there it is. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Not be bringing in the four by eight checks <laughs> with the TV cameras. Yes, we are giving, you know. We're, we're humble about it. See our four by eight foot check here? <laughs> Let him do it with simplicity, humility. Most, most of the real ones, once they gain some wisdom, they don't want anybody to know that they have that ministry. Because when the leeches find out. I didn't say leeches on tape, did I? <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> Well, where are they going to go? They're not going to go to the ones that don't have the money. They're going to go to the ones that do have the money. So the real ones, the people that have that ministry of giving and have any wisdom, man, they're going to do it as, anonymous, as anonymously as they possibly can. They just want to be the hand of God. They don't need any pat on the head but from him. Okay? He that ruleth with diligence. I thought that was interesting. You think of all the words that could go there. He that ruleth with compassion. Didn't use that word. He that ruleth with uh, gentleness. Didn't use that word. He that ruleth with diligence. <clears throat> One, <clears throat> the ones that are truly called to, how do I use this word? <clears throat> you have to couple this up with Peter's writings where he talks about as an example of being a, an elder. He says, how you rule is you rule by example. You remember that? To lead the flock, you do it by example. Well, that takes some diligence. I've been here 19 years. I've been watching Pastor Dave for 19 years. And I'm still following his example. Diligence. Hmm. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. <laughs> I have this picture in me. Mercy. What is mercy? Well, they did it. <laughs> they did the bad thing. God, God called you specifically to go have mercy on them. Yeah, I'm forgiving you. <laughs> All right, but I ain't happy about it. <laughs> I just think that's interesting words there. He, he that... He that showeth mercy, oh, yeah, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. <laughs> Let me look up that one in the Amplified. That'd be interesting. Romans 12, 8 in the Amplified. He who exhorts and encourages uh, to his exhortation. He who contributes, let him do it with simplicity and liberality. Hmm. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. He who, he who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness. And joyful eagerness. Ooh, I like that. See, I think that's the way the Lord really is. He loves sinners. He is eager and joyful to show mercy. Yeah, I like that. Now, verse 9. This is such an important verse right here. Let love be without dissimulation. That's a word we use every day. <laughs> Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that 
which is good. Let's read the next verse together, and then I'll go to the Amplified. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Let me read that out of the Amplified, verses 9 and 10. Let your love be sincere, a real thing. Um, we're family, right? Some people, even, okay. Some people, it's real easy for me to love. I, um, some people, y'all, all everyone's looking. I wonder who he means, you know. <laughs> it's like, it, it's like, in, in some ways, I still have to look to God's law because it's not easy for me to love them, especially if they're hurting the sheep, okay? It's not easy for me. At least that's the way I used to think. Now, part of the problem is as we read these verses, we start reading into it preconceived definitions of what we think love is okay so all it really says is let love be real right? in that context go to first timothy keep your place we're coming back here hopefully go to first timothy Chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writing to Timothy. Now, let's start in verse 3. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia's, Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now let's stop for a minute. What, what did he just say? Well, you know, Paul, and Paul was in Ephesus for about two years, it says. Okay, and then he went to uh, Macedonia. Timothy wanted to go with him. But he says, no, I, when I went into Macedonia, I, be, I besought thee, I asked you to stay at Ephesus. Well, what do you want me to do while I'm here? How would you like this job? Don't let anybody else teach anything different than what I taught. And if they try, I'm charging you to stop them. I'm beginning to understand now why Paul later says, take a little wine for your stomach. <laughs> what kind of H-E double hockey sticks do you reckon... You, how much flack you reckon Timothy ran into? You know, we're going to teach it this at length. I'm still digesting a big part of this, but I'll, it's like it slapped me in the face what Timothy's job really was. What? Yeah, look what it says. That's his. That's his assignment. That you charge some, whoever it is, that they teach no other doctrine. Meaning they're going to try. Now, we're, the topic, what I'm really turned over here for is where it says, let love be without dissimulation. Or in the Amplified, it says, uh, let love be sincere and a real thing. Well, it's the same author. Wrote Romans. Wrote the letter to Timothy. You reckon he knows what love is? So he gives an example now down here. And this fits right in with the current teachings on warring of the prophecies and everything. We're still in that very thing. Because, so come on down to verse 18. It said, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee. In other words, it's already been prophesied to you that you're going to be this person who understands pure doctrine. And you're going to stop any other doctrine from being taught. You know those prophecies have already gone forward on you. Now do a warfare by them. 
that by them thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander. You reckon Paul loved them with love that was real? Whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Why? <laughs> Let your love be a sincere and real thing. Well, what were they teaching that was so heinous? We've got that too. Come over to First Timothy, no, Second Timothy. You don't have to guess what it was. Second Timothy, chapter two. Verse 16, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase. Now, you might as well, you could write in the margin, false doctrine. And he gives you an example, false doctrine, what he's talking about. He calls them profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as does a canker, that's a, like a cancer. Of whom is Hymenus and Philetus? So apparently there was three of them. Hymenus, Alexander, and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have erred. Now what was their false doctrine? Saying that the resurrection is past already. And by doing that they're overthrowing the faith of some. This is false doctrine. How serious did Paul take false doctrine? I turned them over to Satan. They may learn not to blaspheme. Real love will not let people destroy the church with false doctrine. Real love, and it's got to be, here we go with Pastor Dave again. You can't even walk in that level of authority, I don't think, until you attain to a certain level of the love of God. Dave talks about, the, he saw one time on his journeys, and two pastors or two ministers got into this squabble. He says, well, I... I I turn you over to the devil. No, he says, well, I'm turning you over to the devil in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm turning you over to the devil in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord from heaven. And it, neither one of them had authority to turn either one of them over because they're like little babies in the playpen. Hmm. But apparently th Paul had it. Timothy had it. Paul wrote both of these letters. And Paul, the same one who says, let your love be a re sincere and real thing. Turns right around with that same love and says, these two men are destroying the church with false doctrine. I'm going to turn them over to Satan until they learn to quit doing that. Now, what does that really mean? What all happened to them? We're not told. You can speculate as well as I can speculate. But he says why he did it. Not that, not to, that they perish. That they learn not to blaspheme. And that's that's that's. Better to learn not to blaspheme, get back on track, preach pure doctrine, live great, go to heaven. Amen? That's pure love. That's real love. I almost hesitate to, boy, I wouldn't teach this at so many churches because I know they don't have the foundation you have. You give somebody that's, uh, that all, what they want is recognition. Man, they'll take that little snippet right there and say, yep, I found my calling. I'm called to straighten everybody out with their false doctrine. You know, yeah. But you got to teach it. See, this is part of why Paul says to the Corinthians, I couldn't teach you. But nothing but just baby food, because you're just babies. Well, if we're going where God says, when we are going where God says we're going, we got to have some meat once in a while. Okay? But can y'all see real love, love that is sincere, is quite different than our little ushi gushi? Oh, you know, pat, 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 they meant well. They're destroying the church with false doctrine. Hmm. Back to Romans 12. <laughs> Wish somebody go start my car. <laughs> now I'm okay here, I think. I'll know later. <laughs> Let's do verses 9 and 10 in the Amplified. I'm going to read the whole thing. 
Let, let your love be sincere, a real thing. Okay, I can't get past that yet. Parents, you know and I know, real love. I never will forget that day. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, grandparents are even worse. <laughs> I mean, how I feel about Cole and Lily. I love all my grandchildren. They're just the little ones now. My other ones are, you know, they're like grown, 17, 19, 20. I never will forget that day. Lily was about three years old, and it was just a beautiful, nice day. Just, you know, I'm sitting on the front porch, and Lily's playing. We got a little flower bed with rocks and everything. She was stacking rocks and showing me rocks. And, and it was just perfect. And our front yard is not very far from the street, but just a normal distance, you know. And without warning, I'm sitting in a chair on the porch. She's playing. And for some reason, without saying a word, she just bolts. She just starts running straight for the street where there's traffic. Papa doesn't move as fast as Papa used to. But you should have seen me. I think I, with, in one motion, I came out of the chair, went over the flower bed, landed in the yard. And I just got her just at the curb. I mean, she was just almost in the street. I know I'll get letters for this. It's okay. I grabbed her up by the left arm. She's dangling in space as I'm swatting her little diapered rump going, Don't you ever! <laughs> <laughs> and if I, if I see her run for destruction again, and I don't care if she's 20, <laughs> now I won't spank her that way, but <laughs> I'll do something. I'm not going to sit by and watch who I love run for destruction. Real love doesn't do that. Let your love be real. Let it be sincere. Even if they hate you for it. How many... Parents at some point or another, and don't, don't raise your hand, but I, most parents, some point or another, hear the dreaded words, I hate you. <laughs> Just warms the cockles of your heart, you know. Here you've spent the untold thousands, tens of thousands of dollars raising this person and providing everything and putting up. No, I didn't say putting up with them. You know, I mean, and... And you love them, you love them, and you poured your life into them till they get to that wonderful rebellious stage. I hate you. I don't ever want to talk to you again. Slamming my door, don't you come into my room. And I'm going, when did you start paying rent? <laughs> when did you buy that room? What do you mean your room? It's anyway. <laughs> But see, it, why did that happen? Well, because they don't like what you're doing. And what you're doing is love manifested, trying to do everything you can to get them to do right. And they don't like it. I hate you. They don't really. But real love just keeps right on past that. Hallelujah. It's worth it. They're, I got, they're good. I love my, my kids. Love them. Hallelujah. We're still trying to finish these two verses. Let your love be sincere, a real thing. Now, in the King James, it's pretty good. Abhor. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. He hasn't changed the subject. He's talking about the new nature and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring forward that new nature. To manifest the love walk is really what it is. To manifest the love. If we had time, we'd go back to 1 Timothy again. Right after he gives Timothy that instruction to charge. And he says, don't you let anybody, don't let anybody teach any other doctrine. Two verses later, he says, now the end of the whole thing is love. Hmm. Real New Testament godly love stops the child. When the child is running for destruction. Got to say it again. See, Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. In the Amplified it says. Let your love be a sincere and a real thing. Hate what is evil. Brackets. Loathe all ungodliness. Turn in horror. From wickedness. That's pretty good isn't it? Turn in horror from wickedness. 
but hold fast to that which is good. Well, you got to be careful at certain points, you know. say it right you, you cannot as a parent be an enabler and think you're going to help that child now you cannot uh, doesn't mean you I mean God is long suffering and that long suffering will come through you God is patient that patience will come to you but there's a difference between that and enabling in your house Certain bad behaviors. Got to remember, the prodigal son could not continue in his ways in the father's house. But the father loved him. He was looking every day at that front porch, hoping he returns. Going on from there, <laughs> quickly, Romans 12.10. Now, King James says, be, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. In the Amplified, that one says, love one another with brotherly affection. Now get this, as members of one family. See, that word brotherly literally means brotherly. We're in one family. Giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Back to the King James. Verse 11, not slothful in business. Now, in, in this particular case, that's not commercial business like you know your your flower shop or your barber shop <laughs> it just means inactivity for the lord so uh, in verse 11 in the amplified it says never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor be aglow and burning with the spirit serving the lord that's what it means okay rejoicing in hope i'm going to read these out of the amplified you've read them out of the king james for years let's just do it in the amplified now Rejoice and exult in hope. Be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation. <laughs> That's easy. I'd rather encounter all joy when that falls into divers' temptations. Here he says, be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation and be constant in prayer. Continuing instant in prayer. Hmm. You know, you got to be careful of something I've noticed over the years. If I'm not careful, <laughs> you can have a pretty good prayer life till trouble comes. <laughs> what I mean is, you can be. You know, everything's great. I set aside an hour a day. I'm praying. I'm doing, you know, whatever it is you do. And I'm praying. And, and then trouble comes and it consumes you. And it's all you think about. It's all you can see. You become like, your mind becomes like a laser focused only on that. Prayer goes out the window. And you're starting to do like everybody else does. Instead of talking to your mountain, you're telling everybody else about your mountain. Then they're going to try and compare their mountain to your mountain. And all the time it says, no, stay constant in prayer while you're standing patiently in the trouble. Verse 13. Uh, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Contribute to, in, in Amplified, contributing to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessities of the, of the saints. And pursue the practice of hospitality. Now, you talk about not being conformed to the world. These next few verses. It's like, here we go back to Luke 6, you know. Bless them which persecute you. Let's go all the way back to, in our thinking, don't turn there. Let's go back to Proverbs 3 for a minute. <laughs> the guy who says, everything in him, the spiritually dead man says, revenge is good. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. 
No, 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 God. <laughs> well, I'm finding even in the New Testament, new creatures. Until you've done Romans 8 for a while, and what I mean by that is not only been born again, but allow that Holy Spirit to make intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered and allow him to start transforming how you think, how you feel, transform your love, transform your priority levels. I'm telling you, at least for me, verse 14, bless them which persecute you and bless and curse not did not come naturally. Or if it did, it sure didn't seem like it. You know, it's a getting better, but don't test me. <laughs> Or let's say it this way, test at your own peril. Now, I've seen Dave get tested. I mean, I've seen it a lot. I've seen people just get so mad, you know. And I like how Alan said it. You know, you just poke Dave with a stick, you know, just poke him anywhere, any day. And it doesn't seem like nothing but love ever comes out. You know, I don't care what you do. Amen is right. I've been watching him for all these years. It's behind there, too. I mean, I, everywhere I've ever seen him. Me? <laughs> Still, it depends what day you poke me. Depends where you poke me, you know. You might get away with it insulting me, but insult my grandchild. Come on. Come on. I'll bless you. Get right over here. I'll bless you. <laughs> Got a right and a left hand blessing for you right now. What did you say about Lily? Come here. <laughs> but bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. <laughs> Amplify. Fourteen. Bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude toward you. Bless and do not curse them. I mean, they're just downright cruel. Not just bad, they're cruel. And he says, you bless them. <laughs> rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, I'll get in trouble for this later probably. I don't want to do it anyway. I, and it's, Tim is sitting right there. But I remember Dave one time. This was quite a few years ago. Uh, talking about something he saw regarding Tim, you know. And Tim... In, even in the business world, before he really became a Christian, you know, he was in the banking world. And, I mean, companies would fly him around the world and pay all of his expenses and pay him a, a, a good stipend, I think this is the word, for just, just for him to fly there and give them his wisdom. I mean, this man was well known. And then in the Christian world, he's worked with many of the major ministries. I won't start listing them, but you would know most of them. Help them. Save millions of dollars and help them with, you know, reach more people and all of these things. I mean, the man has sought people fly this guy around the world. And one day Dave was walking by the offices up there when Tim had his office here. And he walked by and there was Tim spending an hour, maybe two hours, counseling a street person. Somebody didn't have two nickels to rub together. And he was only doing it for one motivation. And it's the love of God. To rescue that one soul. Condescend to those of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And the Amplified, that verse reads, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Snobbish. That's snobbish. High-minded and exclusive. But readily adjust yourself to people and things. And give yourselves to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Now, verse 17, just like the world. Yeah, we're just exactly like the world. <laughs> Recompense to no man evil for evil. You hope you get help and amplified that it'll be different. <laughs> that can't mean what it says there, God. It just can't mean that. And amplified it says, 
Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. Recompense to no man. You say, well, Paul sure recompensed Hymenus and Alexander and Philetus over there. No, he didn't. He didn't do anything bad to them at all. He did what, a, what the love of God would do and rescue his children who are running for destruction. And he was rescuing them, that they learned not to do that. Very similar to what I did with Lily. That, why? That she learned not to do that. And she's never done it again. Hmm. Verse 8, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now that verse will save your life. It really will. As far as is possible with you, it finally dawned on me, they got a part to play in that. I'll tell you real quickly again, there's a lady in town, a minister, that I, that I owe a lot to because she was instrumental in getting all three. I used to say off the street, and, and my daughter said, you know, we never were prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mean to imply that at the time. I meant they were, they were going to the bars and they were just in the world, you know. They were just, you know, having, you know, just sinners. I've told you about me and Sue, so okay, anyway. But anyway, this, this lady preacher was instrumental with each one of them, getting them out of that lifestyle, you know, just partying and drinking and getting them back, back with God. And I, I mean, I really appreciated it. So I went over there and I was trying to, you know, just fellowship and, Soon, and I don't know why it is, but as soon as she found it out, I was one of those, quote, faith people. You know? She just pigeonholed me in a prosperity box that I'm one of those prosperity preachers and didn't want nothing to do with me. I kept trying to tell her otherwise. And I did everything. Angie could bear witness. I did for a long time. I, kept, I would go and I would give offerings and I would take them to lunch. I would do everything. And this lady did not like me. See, in those days, you had to like me. And I couldn't live unless you did. <laughs> I, my my self-image was so low, you, I couldn't stand it, you know. And this very past, I mean, I did everything for more than a year, more than a year trying to, and no matter what I did, this lady did not like me. She didn't like this church. She didn't like Dave. She didn't like nothing. <laughs> Finally, I was going through here in this very verse. You know, I was going, I don't know what to do, God. And it says, if, it's, if it be possible, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And I, the Lord asked me, he says, well, have you done everything you know to do with her? I said, yes, above and beyond. I mean, and, you know, he says, now this isn't the exact wording, but this is the understanding I got. Has it dawned on you, your presence does not bless her? I went, yeah. <laughs> he says, can you love her enough to let her not like you? God just doesn't think like we think. I had to chew on that a minute. What? Can you love her enough to let her not like you? And you can just love her from afar. I said, oh. See, it says as far as it's possible with you. She has a part to play. And if she really doesn't want to change, there's nothing I can do about that. But my hands are clean. I know I've done all I can do. So I, that started a whole new level of walk. By the way, that was a real maturity day. It's, that was a step up in my walk to allow people not to like me anymore. You have to have that or you can't preach the truth. So two more, three more verses. Aren't you glad we're almost done? <laughs> That this is great, though. I love this. This is exactly what this is. This is exactly where we're going. We're becoming that kind of a person all the time. So, dearly beloved, verse 19, avenge not yourselves. And see, I, I'll be honest with you, these people were born again that Paul wrote this letter to, and he knew they were born again. The very fact he has to write these things to them tells me they had trouble walking in it, too. So it gives me some encouragement. All right. They grew, I can grow. They changed, I can change. Okay. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Verse 19 in the Amplified. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Requite, says the Lord. But see, what the Lord will do, how he'll show his vengeance, he'll wind up getting them saved if he can. Yeah, he will. He'll wind up getting them saved. That's how he shows his vengeance. You know? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Verse 21, here's the end of the matter. Be not overcome of evil. And that's exactly what it's trying to do is overcome you. It's trying to get you operating back like an old flesh creature from the Old Testament. So be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God did that with you? <laughs> See, now it's our turn to be that same way towards others. Hallelujah.